Hi, good afternoon. Um, welcome to Common Cause's call on uh, fracking for influence. I'm Mary Boyle with Common Cause, and we're really excited to be here with a, a great uh, panel of speakers who are going to talk about all different aspects of fracking. Um, let me just lay out how things will work here so you know where we're going. We have, um, we have four speakers today with us. The first person you'll hear from is James Browning, who is the Regional Director of State Operations for Common Cause, and he's the author of a report that Common Cause uh, put out a couple weeks ago, um, a look at the natural gas industry's $750 million campaign to convince Congress to ignore the dangers of fracking. Uh, next, we're really pleased to have Josh Fox, who is the filmmaker behind the, do the 2010 documentary Gasland, which focused on communities uh, affected by fracking. It's a film that got a lot of rave reviews and has received lots of awards. Um, next, we'll hear from Dave Levdansky. Uh, Dave um, was a, a state representative in Pennsylvania from 1985 to 2010 uh, and has been a leading advocate of campaign finance reform. Uh, last but certainly not least is Helen Slotje. And Helen's an attorney and, a com and the head of the uh, Community Environmental Defense Council. Um, up in New York State, she's done a lot of work helping communities fight back against fracking. So uh, we hope to wrap up the speakers and have plenty of time for your questions. So um, why don't we jump right in? Um, James, um, I'm going to hand it over to you. Hello, everyone. I'm James. Uh, Browning, it's really great to have you all on the call. As a quick introduction, uh, I'm our regional state director. I'm based in Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania is where we started our uh, fracking watchdogging work last year just by looking at money coming in at the state level. And what we saw uh, was uh, it, it really an extraordinarily successful campaign by the natural gas uh, industry uh, to convince uh, state lawmakers not to regulate fracking or not to tax, like even not to tax fracking. And with our study this year, we have taken that same approach and tried to expose uh, the money being spent uh, in Congress in the form of campaign contributions and lobbying expenditures and started to expose some of the other avenues of influence that are going to be so important in the future as people debate uh, how strongly to regulate fracking or in some communities uh, whether to have fracking um, at all. One of, one of the most important things that we have discovered in talking to people who uh, maybe don't want any fracking in their community, uh, maybe they, they feel they need many more protections in place before they have fracking, or even people who are, are eager to have uh, drillers uh, come in, uh, is that th there really is a lot of agreement that there hasn't been enough transparency around this issue. And people are, even people who are supportive of fracking, are concerned uh, that there haven't been enough studies done uh, about the damage uh, that the pollution from fracking can do to the environment and human health. And for common cause, there is a very strong parallel between this lack of transparency around the effects uh, of fracking and the lack of transparency around uh, political spending on this issue. Uh, so this is a part of what inspired us to do the study of Congress and what we found, especially in the last few years, is very interesting. Um, the natural gas industry has given more than $20 million uh, to current members of Congress, and we saw the rate uh, of contributions uh, more than triple in just the last election cycle. Now, those of you who follow this issue closely will know that one thing that happened in 2009 and 2010 uh, is that there was a real push in Congress uh, to do more uh, to regulate fracking. There was a big push uh, to try to pass the FRAC Act, uh, which would regulate better regulate fracking at the federal level and actually require disclosure of all the different chemicals used in the fracking process. And the industry was very afraid uh, with a Democratic Congress, with President Obama, that uh, something might actually be done. Um, you know, this is an industry that enjoys really extraordinary exemptions from environmental laws at the federal level. As the 
New York Times has reported the fracking uh, is exempt from seven of the 15 major environmental laws passed in the last 50 years. They have been exempt from the Clean Water Act, from the Clean Air Act, from the Superfund Act, and most recently from the Safe Drinking Water Act, which happened in 2005, due largely uh, to the influence of uh, Dick Cheney, who got an exemption from the Safe Drinking Water Act put into, to the, into the 2005 Energy Policy uh, Act. Now, this loophole uh, has become known, uh, has become infamous uh, as the Halliburton loophole. Uh, and it's, it's very true that uh, in this case, one person, Dick Cheney, and one company have had extraordinary influence on policy. And in the case of Halliburton, has been extraordinarily generous with campaign contributions. But it, it is very important to note that beyond uh, the Halliburton loophole, that the industry's influence goes much deeper and much broader. And uh, as noted in our report, you know, the last time the EPA uh, did a complete study of this issue was in 2004, before fracking had even started in a lot of states and before it had started in some of the really densely populated uh, areas, such as in Pennsylvania and Ohio. And at the time that the EPA report was released, um, a whistleblower came forward and said that the findings uh, had been largely determined by politics, that they had kept um, information out that would suggest the fracking is much more dangerous um, than, the, than the report said. But what we've learned since then is that uh, this story has happened before, and that when the EPA released a study in 1987 about the potentially harmful effects of fracking, uh, that the author of the study, Carla Greathouse, said basically the same thing, that even back then uh, they had uh, worrisome evidence that the potential for fracking to damage, uh, to pollute the water, damage groundwater supplies, was much greater than the final report indicated. But she said, quote, it was like the science didn't matter, and the industry was going to get what it wanted anyway. So this is an industry, it, it, it's much bigger than Halliburton and Dick Cheney. It is an industry that has very successfully positioned itself and, and its product as the answer to some of America's greatest challenges. They have, they have presented natural gas and fracking as an answer to our energy woes. They say we can get cheaper energy. They've presented it as an answer to some of our foreign policy challenges. They say we can wean ourselves from Middle East oil. They say that in a down economy, this can provide millions of jobs. And they have backed this up um, with the $20 million in campaign contributions, with $720 million in lobbying expenditures, uh, and as anyone who tries to, uh, to follow fracking issues, let's say on the internet, everyone is very familiar with the iconic image of the natural gas industry, that blue and sort of clean looking flame. Probably a lot more people are familiar with that iconic uh, image than they are with some of the spending that's going on behind the scenes. And uh, as Josh Fox will discuss uh, after me, there is another iconic image and it's in Josh's film that is helping uh, to educate people a different, a different kind of flame. Now, I mentioned there are other avenues of influence that we're just beginning to expose. And this is the great challenge for us uh, next year in the 2012 congressional elections, and the great challenge in watchdogging this issue going, going forward. In some ways, this is going to be one of the big energy issues of, of the 21st century, which is that because of last year's uh, Citizens United decision by the US Supreme Court, we now have a situation where uh, all companies and natural gas companies have the ability to make unlimited expenditures on elections. And this really changes the entire uh, political landscape. So anytime a candidate even thinks about challenging uh, the industry, they're going to have to consider the potential uh, of a six-figure, seven-figure ad campaign run against them. And this has a very chilling effect, and this is part of why not just on the fracking issue, but a whole variety of issues, we are working for a disclosure uh, of these new funds that can be spent under Citizens United, and we are working for corporate accountability so that uh, the shareholders themselves at some of these companies have the power to know if money is being spent on elections and even have the power to approve or disapprove of these expenditures. Uh, it, it's notable that at two companies, at Chevron and Exxon, last May at shareholder meetings, just on the issue of getting greater disclosure 
about the dangers of fracking, there were shareholder uh, resolutions introduced at both of those meetings to force the shareholders wanted to force their own companies to be more forthcoming, which is really remarkable. I mean, we, we've seen um, an incredible movement from people in communities that are most affected by fracking, but in some ways things are so um, egregious that the shareholders themselves are rising up and demanding accountability uh, and transparency. One more avenue of influence that I want to talk about, and then we'll turn it over to Josh Fox, uh, is the role of something called the American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC uh, for short. Now, this is a group that is actually registered as a nonprofit group. The corporations can make tax-deductible contributions to them, but what they do uh, is make model laws uh, pushing different corporate interests and push them out into the state. And increasingly, they are taking a big interest in fracking and trying to prevent any kind of regulation at the state level or at the federal level, uh, and that is another area where Common Cause uh, is working to expose all of this new spending. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Mary to introduce Josh Fox. Great. Thank you very much, James. And I would point out that um, if you're interested in taking a look at that report, you can find it at Common Cause's website at www.commoncause.org slash fracking. 2012. Um, next we have Josh Fox, who is the director of the Oscar-nominated documentary film Gasland. Um, over to you, Josh. Hey, thanks very much. I uh, just wanted to make sure everybody can hear me okay. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> um, well, <clears throat> I, I just want to thank uh, James for that amazing uh, wrap-up. Um, when I got involved with uh, looking at fracking was uh, sort of accidental, I, I guess. I live in the Upper Delaware River Basin, which is in the uh, in Pennsylvania, right on the border of Pennsylvania and New York. And around uh, spring of 2008, around the time of the Democratic primary in PA, um, me and uh, my family started getting notices in the mail about leasing our land for natural gas drilling, which was very odd because you know it's a watershed area. It's part of the interconnected watershed system which provides water to 15.6 million people in New York City and Philadelphia and southern New Jersey, the upper Delaware. It's a beautiful area. It's a wild and scenic river. We've never had a proposal for industrial development or drilling. Um, so it was sort of like an alien landing in the backyard. And when the gas industry comes in, they, they're all sweetness and light. They say basically, you know, you're going to make a lot of money and, you know, we're, we're this is just a fire hydrant in the middle of a field of yours. It's very environmentally friendly. And, but when you look into it, as some of my neighbors had, you find out that there are uh, you know, many carcinogenic chemicals that are injected in the ground at, at very large quantities. Uh, the, the, the pressures that they use to frack are very um, uh, explosive. There's 20,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. You've got a trail of contamination and complaints that's easy to find on the internet um, going across the country. And these, of course, exemptions that, that uh, James mentioned to the Safe Drinking Water Act, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, Superfund Act. Uh, and then finding out, of course, that Dick Cheney and, and Halliburton were behind this proposal gave me a lot of pause. So what I did was went to a neighboring town, which has just recently been in the news, Dimmick, Pennsylvania, um, and found that that place was a disaster area, that they were overrun with drilling trucks, that there were residents who could light their water on fire. Um, that there were residents who water had turned black and that their animals and their children were getting sick, and, a, and an atmosphere of, uh, of fear that was palpable um, and distrust and confusion and dismay, as if these, these, these basic you know, control over daily life had been completely overthrown. Um, and this bucolic uh, place in Pennsylvania had been turned into an industrial drilling zone overnight with toxic chemicals all over the place, spills happening into creeks, um, uh, vast pits of drilling waste being stored right next to residential homes and schools, just all manner of insanity. Um, the film Gasland is then sort of my trip across the United States to discover if Dimmick was the norm or some kind of weird aberration with one drilling company gone uh, mad. And what I found was um, that this was par for the course, that everywhere the drilling uh, fracking industry went. Um, you had an enormous citizen upheaval, you had water contamination, you had people who could light their water on fire, you had air pollution situation, um, a lot of toxic emissions, just, you know, an, a total industrial takeover of those areas. And then looking at the big map, 
seeing that gas fracking was proposed and leasing was going on in 34 states. And when I speak of how this was by accident, it's not really because, you, you, you know, 65% of Pennsylvania right now is up for grabs, 50% of New York being leased, about half of Ohio, all of West Virginia, um, parts of Virginia and Maryland, and this is all part of this one formation called the Marcellus Shale. And why fracking has become such a big part of the news is because what was happening out west in sparser populated areas without as much media coverage um, and with a, a long track record of contamination and problems um, and human rights violations and, and and, and civil upheaval was all of a sudden is all of a sudden happening in uh, the, the east where there's a, a much bigger media market and a lot more people dependent on groundwater. Um, so you know the, the film uh, premiered at Sundance, went on HBO, was nominated for Oscar, um, and has been seen now by I think something like 40 million people in, in 20 countries across the world as we see the fracking industry expand to 50 countries worldwide. Um, and what's come to our attention, and we're making a sequel on this, Gasland 2, and what we're, we're really um, interested in, it, and this is really terrific timing and very, very grateful to Common Cause for this report, is the influence of the oil and gas industry, specifically the natural gas industry, on Congress. Um, and not only on uh, the federal government, but on the state governments um, and how they, they operate in Harrisburg and in Albany and Austin, um, Columbus. So. You know, we're we're investigating that at the same time as this is coming uh, into into uh, uh, awareness with Common Causes report, um, and also looking at the effect of gas fracking on climate change. Because one of the other big points of PR that the gas industry likes to put out is how gas is in fact, uh, or or act not in fact, but this is what they say: uh, gas is cleaner burning than coal. And it's a better source of electricity generation, and we should move our entire electricity generation uh, in the United States over to natural gas. And um, as recent information has come to light, this would be a disaster in terms of any of our emissions targets for, for uh, climate change because the fracking process leaks so much methane into the atmosphere, and methane is many, many times more potent, the greenhouse gas in the atmosphere than CO2 is, um, that, in fact, gas fracking is worse than or on a par with coal as far as looking at climate change. Um, and if we were to move towards fracking as this shale gas revolution, as this new source of energy for the world, um, we're, we're really in deep, deep trouble um, when it, in terms of climate change. And if you look at the stuff that's coming out now, uh, uh, saying that we have five years to correct this problem and we should, we should be in a, a, uh, a total overhaul of our energy production and emission systems in, worldwide. Uh, shale gas fracking, and as we talked to James Hansen, the man who discovered climate change, uh, is game over. You know, it's 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 like um, one of the it's something we cannot possibly recover from in terms of runaway climate change. Um, so we're going to be focusing on those issues uh, coming going forward. Uh, but what we have discovered in in many many congressional inter interviews uh, over the course of the last six months, we sort of took a supersized me approach to uh, interviewing Congress, which is say how many congressional interviews can I do in a limited period of time before my liver explodes? Um, and that, uh, that was the joke. Uh, I can't hear anybody laughing out there. I hope you are. But um, it, <laughs> it did sort of feel like that after a while. And that what we got back from the, from the members of Congress who would speak to us about this is a sense not only of the money, but of this incredible amount of um, legacy influence. Of, of oil and gas. That simply, you know, for the last hundred years, oil and gas has an entrenched and, and uh, very established influence in Congress. And, you know, Representative Brad Miller of North Carolina, when I asked him, well, tell us about the influence of oil and gas in Congress, he just sort of laughed and he goes, influence, try ownership. Um, and that was the sentiment that we heard over and over again from lawmakers. And any, uh, and just to wrap up and sum up to sort of my perspective on this, it's worthwhile going into the campaign of Maurice Hinchy in 2010. Maurice Hinchy was uh, one of the leading proponents of the FRAC Act, which was mentioned earlier, to um, disclose the fracking chemicals, which are in many cases proprietary and uh, unknown to people as they're being injected into the ground. Um, Maurice Hinchy, in his re-election campaign in 2010, in a safe blue Democratic district, he uh, had never had a, certain, a significant challenge, very, very popular, 20-year congressman, they mounted uh, the gas industry uh, over a million dollar 
smear campaign against him in the 2010 election. They were very, very worried about it. There was, uh, they really had to uh, go out there and, and fight for their lives and won the district by 8,000 votes. Um, very, very scary. And all of this due to the fact that he had opposed um, you know, the unregulated drilling of natural gas. And here is the congressman for the New York City watershed. This is the, this is the congressman who is uh, protecting um, 15.6 million people's water supply. So uh, I'm sure that we'll hear a lot more about the influence of oil and gas on Congress and on our state governments going into the future. And it's great that there's a consciousness of this. I think this is something that, uh, of course, especially in light of Citizens United, as was mentioned, is going to be a uh, growing concern because, as other people have mentioned to us, this is a fundamental change to American democracy. And one of the leading forces behind that change is the oil and gas industry. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you so much, Josh, and thank you for your movie that has done so much to raise awareness about this issue around the world, and we're really looking forward to seeing, uh, seeing the sequel, so thank you. Um, Next, as I mentioned, is uh, Dave Levin, I'm sorry, Dave Le Le Levdansky, um, who served in the State House, um, a former Pennsylvania State Representative, former chair of the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania House's Finance Committee. Thank, thank you, Mary. Um, sure. Uh, I, I also spent, um, I, I spent 16, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, 13 terms in the Pennsylvania legislature, two-year terms. And, for 12 of those 13 terms, I was also uh, uh, the second-ranking Democrat on the Energy and Environmental Resources Committee. So I've de developed expertise in both tax policy and, um, uh, and in environmental policy as well. And, and uh, have worked with Barry Kaufman and Common Cause in Pennsylvania throughout my, throughout my entire career to promote uh, campaign finance reform in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is, is unique amongst most states in terms of campaign finance law insofar as we have never had any limitations on the amount of money that tax or wealthy individuals could contribute to candidates for office in Pennsylvania. Uh, whereas candidates, uh, you know, for Congress, uh, you know, you know, r roughly, uh, you know, ha had limits on how much money they could raise from individuals in tax. In Pennsylvania, when you ran for the legislature or for local government or for county government, there there, there were and continue to be no limits on the amount of money. Now, we do have a state law that prohibited direct contributions from, from union treasuries or for corporate treasuries. Um, but now, with the advent of the decision from Citizens United, corporations have a very easy way now to, uh, uh, to inject huge amounts of corporate cash to in influence elections in Pennsylvania. Um, I lost my election, and, and in, in no small part last year, due to the enormous amount of money that was channeled through these outside groups uh, to, to, to fund uh, negative ads uh, against me. Um, I estimate well over uh, $400,000 to $450,000 was spent in a state house, in my state house race on behalf of my opponents uh, to remove me from office, uh, and they got me by about 152 votes. I'm absolutely convinced that the, that the reason why I attracted so much outside money um, and, 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 uh, and in the last 10 days, the last week or two of the campaign, I was informed that the oil and gas industry pumped about $600,000 into this uh, House uh, Republican Campaign Committee to be, to be spent uh, on targeted races, inc including mine. I'm absolutely convinced that I attracted so much outside money uh, to be spent against me in large part because of my strong uh, support for uh, be better and stronger environmental regulations to regulate fracking in the oil and gas industry, and for my strong uh, and, and my strong advocacy in the context of being the finance committee chair, uh, to put in place a, a reasonable uh, drilling tax uh, on on the on the frackers in Pennsylvania, just as every other state that has um, that, that has natural gas extraction has a drilling tax or a severance tax. I've led the effort to impose one here in Pennsylvania. Um, unfortunately, uh, with no success, uh, despite our strong fight, um, I have. So I, I think this issue um, is really dovetails and shows the, the importance of of campaign contributions on, on on environmental policy. In Pennsylvania, we have a 
you know, oil and gas exploration and drilling are not new to Pennsylvania, though, though with fracking and the development of Marcellus Shale, it is, it is really uh, expanded by leaps and bounds. You know, oil uh, was first, you know, developed in, uh, here in Pennsylvania, you know, more, more than a century ago, uh, back in the late 1800s. Uh, so we have a history of developing resources in Pennsylvania and the environmental scars to go along with them, especially in the case of coal and, and strip mining. Um, in Pennsylvania, you know, we had a, an oil and gas act that was passed in 1964 is when it was written. Uh, and it dealt with traditional, sh traditional shallow well oil and gas development. What, we, what, that, what that law doesn't do is anticipate the, the enormous challenges posed by hydraulic fracturing. So we have been about the business of trying to upgrade our, our state law to regulate oil and gas drilling along with the regulations uh, to be promulgated uh, in accordance with those laws to, pr to better protect our groundwater, to better protect our surface water, and to regulate the emissions into the air as well. Unfortunately, we've really not caught up, okay? And what's happened is, is that the, the drilling took off, and then the state, uh, the, the state DEP, Department of Environmental Protection, was in a position to try to promulgate regulations to address the problems that are posed by, by hydraulic fracturing. And unfortunately, you know, the genie was already out of the bottle. Um, you know, New York, in my judgment, probably did it the best way by de facto. They didn't put a moratorium in place. They just didn't issue any permits until such time as they were able to promulgate and adopt rules and regulations uh, to tightly control the industry to make sure that the fracturing will be done uh, in an environmentally safe and prudent manner. Uh, in Pennsylvania, we, we, didn't, we didn't do it that way for, for whatever reason. The industry and the development took off, and now we're after the fact trying to pass rules and regulations um, uh, to, to deal with the environmental impact. But one, one thing I noticed, you know, so that's a little bit about Pennsylvania and my perspective on it. As a legislator, I think, you know, be during Congress or in the state legislature, you want to promote the development of industries and that generate jobs uh, for your citizens. But you also want to make sure that we have a healthy environment for people to live and raise their families in and in healthy places to work as well. So you always have to work to strive to achieve that balance between environmental protection and jobs development as well. And, 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 and you really can, you can strike that appropriate balance and have good jobs while at the same time protecting the environment and ensuring public health. But I think that, that at this point in time in our, in our nation's history, uh, we are really living in perilous times. Our democracy, in my judgment, is under threat because of, uh, because of the decision by the Supreme Court and Citizens United. Uh, I would, I would make, strongly make the case that we have the best federal and state government that money can buy. And, and, and with Citizens United now, corporations clearly can inject huge amounts of money into campaigns to run negative ads against elected officials that, that, that take positions that are contrary to what the frackers want to do. Um, that is, you know, I mean, that, that'll have a chilling effect, that chilling effect on, on, um, on people in, in Congress and state legislatures that want to protect the environment. I mean, you know, one of my colleagues is going to want to stand up and take on the frackers when they know they might have a, a half a million dollars spent against them in their next re-election campaign. So it really has a chilling effect, I think, on the democratic process. Also just want to point out in the report, of the 100 top recipients of campaign contributions from the oil and gas industry, of the 100 who received um, money, only four voted against the Halliburton Act. And I'm sure if you talk to almost everyone in that Congress, they would tell you that there's no connection between their vote and the campaign contributions, okay? Well, look, from my perspective in, in government for 26 years, you know, people in PACs don't contribute, don't make campaign contributions with, you know, four and five zeros before the decimal point because they're interested in good government. They're doing it because they want to affect the outcome of an election 
or they have an issue or a concern that they want you to address. Now they may also, in the, you know, and again, the case I see of the four of the four who didn't vote for the Halliburton Amendment, you know, sometimes, some in my judgment, sometimes PACs and, and wealthy individuals contribute because they're they're concerned that you're in a position where you could hurt them, uh, or you could you could be supporting measures or advancing measures um, that are that are going to impact them. So sometimes they they they, they make the contribution because they want access, they want to be able to talk to you. But when you're writing checks, you know, for you know, for fifty, hundred thousand, or more dollars, you're not buying access or influence. You're buying influence is what you're doing. You're not buying access. So, and with the Citizens United decision, um, I'm just really concerned that the democracy, as we have known it over the decades, is 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 now seriously imperiled by the avalanche of campaign contributions that this report already documents, and I think will only escalate will only escalate until we get a court decision or a Supreme Court that can reverse uh, the onerous impacts uh, caused by Citizens United. Great. And that Thank should be my much. eight minutes. Th thanks so much, Dave. You, you touched on something that I think we'll probably revisit in the question and answer session because I see we're getting a lot of good questions about how to balance the environmental concerns with, um, you know, with economic concerns. Um, and which reminds me, if, you know, for for listeners on the call, if you if you have questions mm -hmm. as you're thinking of them, please feel free to you know email them in, and we're going to get to them very shortly. Um, our next speaker, as I said, is Helen Swatche. She's an attorney with the Community Environmental Defense Council in New York, and has worked with a lot of communities um, where fracking um, is going on. So, hello. Uh, thank you all for joining us today, and thank you so much to Common Cause for this uh, terrific report that they've put together. And what this report does is to just shine a very bright light on the stranglehold that the oil and gas industry has on our politicians and regulators. And so what is the effect of the industry's dirty energy money on our democratic process, as Dave was just talking about? And I wholeheartedly agree that the energy companies and their political action committees and lobbyists and executives do not give money to politicians or political parties out of altruism. These are sophisticated investors, and they expect and are receiving a return on their investment. Industry's money allows energy companies to dictate our national energy policy, and industry is effectively allowed to regulate itself with inspectors and regulators moving through a revolving door between high-paid industry jobs and the government. Our politicians sold the possibility of a timely transition to a clean and affordable energy policy, a future that the public wants and that our economy and national security demand. So how has the oil and gas industry blocked the transition to clean and affordable energy? In large part, through artificially low energy prices that result from the widespread and often wholesale exemptions that the oil and gas industry enjoys from federal and often state environmental laws. These exemptions act as direct subsidies to the industry. The fact that environmental laws might characterize oil and gas waste as non-hazardous does not make them so. It simply results in a transfer of disposal costs from the industry to the communities where the energy is extracted and the waste are disposed. And these community costs are indirect, widespread, and also difficult to measure and prove, in large part due to confidential settlement agreements with their victims, legal protections from disclosure of the chemical cocktails the industry used, industry funding of academic research, and undue influence over governmental researchers. Yet it should be obvious that creating pollution is not a sustainable economy. Destroying roads, farms, and parks, and then rebuilding them or reclaiming them is no more a job creation strategy than breaking windows. Energy companies bombard us with messages that frame energy policy as a choice between energy and the environment, or jobs in the environment, as we were just talking about. In fact, the oil and gas industry's influence is an anchor that keeps the United States from moving to a clean energy economy and ties it to instead to dig deeper and deeper into the fossil fuel hole. We need to cut loose before it's too late. We can have both affordable, clean, renewable energy and a healthy, safe place to work and live. 
Synapse Energy Economics Inc. recently released a report entitled Towards a Sustainable Future for the U.S. Power Sector Beyond Business as Usual. And this report outlines a transition scenario that shows that moving to efficiency and renewable energy is less expensive than business as usual, with a net present value of a 40-year stream of savings of $83 billion. So citizens are fed up with the industry's half-truths, bullying, and undue influence at the federal and state level, and are taking this battle to a field where they can still exercise democratic control, the local level. Our organization, Community Environmental Defense Council, is working with communities across New York State to enact local prohibitions on gas drilling and associated activities. These communities have looked at the experience in other states and determined that they did not want to bear the cost of fossil fuel extraction industry and its negative impacts on their local economies, local infrastructure, such as roads, decreased quality of life from 24-7, truck traffic and noise, and the rollout of an industrial grid. So the powers of local government are determined by state law. And in many states, the ability of local governments to prohibit gas drilling outright is limited. But in New York, there is a strong history of local home rule, and we are spearheading a movement to use land use laws like zoning to prohibit the rollout of the gas fields industrial grid. The community reaction has been overwhelmingly positive. For the first time, activists have a place to voice their concerns where they are not outsiders, and their voices have not yet been completely drowned out by industry money. People are going door to door, collecting petition signatures, talking to their neighbors, and finding out that their concerns about fracking unite them. They then present these results to their town boards, which are often uh, as equally concerned. And this has resulted in local bans or moratoriums or other local laws um, in communities, villages, and cities across New York State. And we're hoping that this local movement both uh, will influence state policy in New York and then ultimately federal policy in a way uh, that will allow us to compete with, with the sort of industry money that, that this report talks about. So thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, we've been, the questions have been coming in while um, our speakers have been talking. Thank you for that. And like I said, one of the questions that we are seeing asked by many of you is, um, you know, fracking isn't going away. Do the environmental costs outweigh the potential economic benefits, or should should fracking be ended? Um, and I'd like to uh, kick this off by uh, with Dave um, Levdansky answering that difficult question. Um, it can it can be a win win both for uh, jobs and for and for the environment as well, but only if uh, state and local governments are really vigorous in terms of uh, advocating uh, for for strong regulations uh, on the industry. Um, uh, look, look with, with the advent of technology, okay, uh, so much uh, you know you could do some so many more things uh, safely today than you could you know, years ago. And I understand that natural resource extraction is never a risk-free endeavor. So it's a matter of weighing the, uh, the pluses and the minuses. Uh, the pluses are obviously there are tens of thousands of jobs uh, in Pennsylvania that, that have been created over the last couple, last couple of years. Uh, but notwithstanding job creation, we need to understand that, you know, we need to, we need to protect the environment and the planet on which we are all inhabitants. So, uh, you know, we we got to make sure. And again, Pennsylvania is a little behind the uh, uh, a little behind the curve on getting this done. Uh, but we could make sure that 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 the frac water that uh, that comes back up in the drilling process, we need to make sure that it's recycled and reused, uh, and not taken to our sewage treatment plants to be processed, and then and then piped into the river where we have increasingly high levels of total dissolved solids and bromide. And that's what we've been doing in Pennsylvania, unfortunately. Uh, we're beginning to stop and reverse that process. So we need to make sure that the frac water is, is contained. We need to regulate the withdrawal of water from our streams that are used in the fracking process. I mean, you could dewater streams, small streams in Pennsylvania, 
when you take a, a, a couple million gallons of water out of them. So you know, it's a delicate balance, but with the advent of technology, you know, you know, th this industry, you know, if it's regulated pr properly and aggressively by state government and the federal government, we could get the benefit of the jobs with, you know, with a source of energy that's cleaner than the traditional, uh, the traditional fossil fuels uh, here in Pennsylvania, especially, you know, coal uh, that we've been dependent on to generate so much of our electricity in the state. So we can, uh, through the use of technology and aggressive uh, government permitting, permitting uh, of the drilling process and regulation of materials uh, and, and disclosure, we can have the uh, we can have jobs and a uh, a safe environment at the same time. Can, can I? This is Josh Fox. Can I? Can I uh, uh, come in here? I, I would. I really would like to respectfully disagree. Um, there, we can also uh, put a man on Mars and develop a condominium complex with existing technology. However, it's never been proven that we could actually do so. There is nowhere on Earth that a regulatory approach to gas fracking has actually worked and protected citizens. I can't point to one, and I've been all over the United States and on four continents investing, investigating this drilling. I think that's uh, fictional. Um, I mean, of course, you could project with um, you know, uh, some of the industry propaganda working uh, on your uh, on your psychology that this is possible but it's simply something that has never been done before and when you're looking at the amount of wastewater and the amount of emissions and the amount of uh, cost that the industry would incur uh, to do what Dave just said it, it's not uh, financially viable to drill at all and you would quickly see renewable energy being far more viable as a source of jobs, as a source of energy, as it already is right now. And what we're talking about here is promoting the worst energy plan and the worst jobs plan over ones that are much better. And the sole reason seems to be the, the subsidies uh, that Helen pointed out and the influence that uh, Mr. Browning has pointed out. Um, and to make an argument that regulating gas fracking works and we could have benef benefits from that in Pennsylvania simply is unsupported in either the journalism uh, or the science. Um, so I, I really have to disagree with that position and that that is what got Pennsylvania in this mess to begin with, which is to say we can regulate this industry so it's going to be fine. But once they've got a foothold, um, especially talking about the things that uh, we just talked about, Citizens United and all this incredible structure of influence that they have, um, there is really no way in, on Earth in, in actual real space and time to implement, uh, implement a strategy that I believe would protect the environment, stop climate change, and uh, uh, you know, do this in a way that is safe. I, I've never seen that. It's unproven and it's speculative. Thanks, Josh. Um, let me let me kind of go with a, a follow up here. Um, similar line question that we're seeing a lot of: Is there a way, or what is the best way, to assure realistic, fair oversight of fracking to protect citizens? Um, who would like to take a stab at that? Uh, James, do you have any thoughts on that? I, that? I'd like to talk about that question in the context of the different um, states where we did a detailed look at how uh, easy or hard it was to track the fracking uh, money. Uh, in addition to our report on Congress, uh, we did detailed reports in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Michigan and found uh, different problems in each. State. And I'd like to go back to uh, what uh, David said uh, about sort of Pennsylvania coming at the 21st century fracking fight with, with an oil and gas law, uh, you know, 50 years old. You know, one of the challenges we found in Ohio um, is that 
there are millions being spent by the industry that we can't even track. Ohio is one of about 20 states that don't make lobbyists report their salaries, and that can comprise 80 to 90 percent of all lobbying uh, expenditures. So, you know, if you're in Ohio and you've seen all of these uh, articles um, about what's happening in the state, or Ohio is getting some of Pennsylvania's uh, fracking wastewater either through the rivers or being shipped to Ohio to store it there, you know, in another state with a stronger lobbying law, uh, all those articles could have figures saying, you know, and by the way, the industry spent, uh, you know, two million dollars on lobbying here last year. Uh, and, you know, again, Dave, Dave's point about the old oil and gas law, what this money has done is convinced Congress and state uh, legislators that these old laws are, are good enough that we can frack first and ask questions uh, later. Um, but what they're not taking into account is that when you combine fracking with horizontal drilling and all of the uh, millions of gallons of wastewater that are produced, it's an entirely different phenomenon with entirely uh, new dangers. And just to give you, you know, a parallel example from Ohio, they've had a, a setback limit of 100 feet saying, well, to protect you know, a residence, you must be at least 100 feet away uh, when you're drilling. You know, and, and that's the standard that was set in the earliest, early 20th century uh, when the biggest danger was 100 foot high oil derricks falling on houses. So states, what we're seeing is, is the debate uh, has been constrained by this money. So states are going at this uh, issue with regulations that are in some cases 100 years old. And so whether, whether it's Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, New Mexico, Colorado, other states where fracking is expanding, this is, this is really key to opening up the debate, is opening up, um, picking up the rocks so we can all see what's under it and where all this money has been going. Thank you, James. Uh, here's another question that a lot of you are, are asking. I'm going to direct to Helen, and that is, what can local communities do to fight back against fracking? So uh, it varies by state, different community, as far as what sort of legal changes communities can enact. Um, in some states, you can have local regulation of the industry, but you can't prohibit it altogether. Uh, in some places, you can't regulate it, and you can't prohibit it everywhere, but you can prohibit it in some places. And in other states, you can use zoning uh, and local land use laws to prohibit high-impact industrial uses like gas drilling. But from our perspective, um, there are sort of three main places where you could try to enact change, at the federal level, at the state level, and at the local level. And while we need to all be working on, on all of those, the place where we see activists having the most ability to affect change and make their voices heard and at least make it clear that there is opposition to this beyond sort of radical tree huggers is by systematically, you know, working at the local level, going out, petitioning uh, their community to find out how, you know, what percentage of people support this idea of fracking, engage in some education while you're at it, talk with your neighbors, and, and then work with your town board to pass whatever sort of local law is appropriate in your state to whether it's, if all, all you can do is a resolution that, you know, you want to forward to the state, um, that your community is against this, but making it clear that this is not a fringe, you know, outside movement, that this is really lots of real people all over the country all sorts of, you know, demographically, politically, um, geographically, very diverse, and that so that we can't be sort of marginalized and uh, and not listened to. Great, thank you. That's that's very helpful. Um, our next question is to Josh, and there are a lot of people on the call, Josh, wondering uh, what, if anything, you could tell us about the sequel to Gasland. Uh -huh. Well, <laughs> um, I think I said a few uh, a few things there that the 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 um, emphasis 
of the film, you know, in the first movie we focused on the contamination of water, the contamination of air. And I think in the, other, in the next film our focus is on the contamination in Washington. Um, every uh, dollar of the $1.6 million that Tom Corbett took uh, for his campaign, that the natural gas industry gave to him uh, for his campaign and for governor in Pennsylvania, is a contaminant. And in the same way um, as we have proprietary chemicals, and you don't know the origin of those chemicals, you have proprietary uh, campaign contributions that you don't know the origin of. Uh, so I, I would say that that is a part of this that we haven't spent a lot of time looking at in the first film. Um, and I also want to emphasize that although in the United States it is uh, – almost at a standstill to, to talk about climate change. Um, what we have found in our research and in our interviews is that it is uh, just an unbelievably devastating scientific profile um, coming at us now that says we have to deal with this. And, you know, it is terrifying when James Hansen says to us, in his interview, look, in the scientific community, we had a, a kind of a risky plan, uh, a, a breakneck plan to deal with just the conventional oil and gas that was left on the planet. If we were figuring out how to deal with getting ourselves off of the conventional oil and gas, that is to say gas and oil that can be derived and coal without fracking, without tar sands extraction, without deep water drilling, uh, without um, uh, mountaintop removal. Just those forms would have been very hard for us to reverse climate change. If we go in the direction of unconventional fossil fuel development, and that is to say, without any of these water contamination issues even coming into play, if we're burning all this natural gas for another 100 years, we, there's no way out. And that was a life-changing, incredibly chilling uh, interview at a moment for, for me, to be sitting here with a man who discovered climate change. Um, who was working for NASA in the 70s, sending spacecraft to Venus, and noticed, oh, look at these interesting things called greenhouse gases that have heated up the surface of Venus to 700 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to melt lead at the surface of the planet. How did that happen? Um, why is Venus hotter than Mercury? And, you know, looking at this, and, and then you, you sit, you sit with him in his apartment at Columbia University, and he says, you know, if we go in the direction of developing fossil fuels rather than move, uh, unconventional fossil fuels through these extreme energy techniques, and fracking is, I think, at the top of the heap there, um, we're, we're really kind of doomed. And I, I don't want to overstate that, but this is the position of all the reasonable science. And, you know, he also mentioned, which was, I thought, incredibly touching, scientists are not equipped to defend themselves in the media. They're not people who are good at sound bites. They don't have budgets to go out there and, and uh, promote their ideas. They're simply scientists. And, you know, it, 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 even at, at the peril of entering this fray, you know, of climate change debate in America, which is, is politically very toxic and very, very difficult, and you have people like ExxonMobil coming after you, um, it, it's still the truth and it's still the right thing to do. So I think that that's uh, at least part of the emphasis in this film. And, of course, we, we, we follow up with the people in the first film and see where they're at um, and see how those situations have uh, gotten worse in, in, in most cases. Um, and then there are new case histories. So, you know, there's a lot in the, in the new film. I'm, I'm very, very excited about it. And uh, uh, it's, I, I think it's, it's going to advance the, the debate on this quite, quite a lot. That's great. Thanks, Josh. We, we look forward to seeing it. Um, last, last question before we close. Um, uh, if the dangers of fracking are known, who can provide oversight if not our government? Who is at the top of the food chain here? Helen, um, James, any thoughts on that one? So this is Helen. Um, that's part of the problem. What happened with the with the Gulf blowout was that the government didn't even have it remotely enough information or ability to handle the emergency response. 
So we have left industry to regulate itself. And the oil and gas industry is, in fact, bigger than any single government, um, let alone a scientist trying to defend themselves against the industry. I mean, these are, you know, the size of small countries. So, and that's part of the, the problem of consolidation of corporate control and the like, and we've ultimately created something that really we're not in a position to regulate it anymore, I don't think, personally. Huh. Can, I, can I add one little short thing here? This is Josh. Please do. This is a democracy still, um, whether that democracy happens with voting or with other techniques such as protests and getting out in front of things. The top of the food chain is always the citizen, always the organized citizen. So whatever um, that takes, it's going to be people in the street it's going to be uh, making a very, very loud noise uh, about this and demanding change. Thanks. That's that's a great point. Yes, so before I we totally agree. Before we close, um, I'm going to turn the call over to um, Catherine Whitnabin, who is Common Cause's Vice President for Development. Hi. I want to thank everybody so much for joining us today. I, I, it's very encouraging to see that hundreds of people signed up to participate with us today during this especially busy time of year. I often hear from members that ask us how they can make a difference on a really difficult issue such as fracking. And you've heard many great ways today from all of our speakers, and I thank all the speakers also for their, their time and, and energy on this issue because we know it's how difficult it is to challenge the corrupting influence of money and politics on an issue such as fracking. So I'd like to mention three more ways today that you could actually make a difference today. First, it would be really great if you'd send out information, either the fracking report or information on this webinar to at least five other people who you'd like to inform about this issue and get involved in helping on this issue. So your friends, your family, your colleagues, if you could send out the link to the report or send out when we get the, we'll get the recording up of this webinar on our website, you could let people know about this and, and tell them about why you care about this. So that's the second thing. We'd really love to hear from you about your story, why fracking is important to you, why you care about this issue how it's impacting you, how it's impacting your community, and what you're planning to do about it. One of the things that we're learning at Common Cause is our stories are really important. And you know we have a huge educational job to do here, and, and your stories will really help us be educating other people about this really critical issue. And then third, because I am the head of fundraising here, I'm sorry about this, but I, this is my job. It would be really great if you could make a contribution to help support our continuing campaign on fracking. And you'll see that we have a website set up an online place where you can go to www.commoncause.org forward slash fracking. And our goal today is to raise $50,000 to continue our campaign against fracking. As James has pointed out, fracking is going to be a huge issue in congressional elections next year. We're already seeing a major surge in independent expenditures from the natural gas industry. And Common Cause is dedicated to watchdogging these expenditures to hold everyone accountable, the natural gas industry and our elected officials and to continue to inform and activate our, our fellow citizens. Fracking is going full steam ahead in many states, and the natural gas industry wants to expand this wherever it can, so we're seeing this is going to be an increasing problem at the national and state level. So anything you can do to help us today to financially support us and continue our campaign would be greatly, greatly appreciated. And thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it, and we wish you a happy holiday. Thank you very much. Thank you again to our speakers, and thank you to our listeners, and for everyone who sent, sent in questions. They were fantastic. For those who didn't have people who didn't get their questions answered, we're going to be following up with you to answer all of your questions. So thank you again for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye.